Hi everybody, it's Lindsay checking in. Um, I just wanted to leave you guys a little video note to say thank you so much for all of your work uh, last week um, and that I feel like we're well and fully launched now. I was kind of delaying a little bit um, digging in as I knew that there were lots of people who were having a bit of a late start um, and some people who are trying to get into the course and all kinds of stuff. But now I feel like we're well and truly started. Um, and I hope that you've been able to sort of see some of the ways that the design of the course is just, is, um, is created to help you compare and contrast all these different versions of action research. Um, now you've got some action research under your belt and you've got some participatory action research under your belt. And in fact, some of you have also been introduced to the idea of YPAR or youth participatory action research, which uh, makes me really excited when you guys are reading um, these articles and then you kind of twig and think, huh, I wonder if I could use that in my classroom or with kids that I know. Um, I would say that I um, added a whole bunch of new articles to this course over the Christmas holidays. So I was totally excited to see you guys picking up on those, some of those 2020 articles. Um, so yeah, so at this point we've had week one where you guys have um, started to get your feet wet with action research, introduce yourselves, um, and do a little contrast and compare. And then a few of you have actually decided that you wanna um, do an actual research project within your classroom or an action research project within your classroom of some sort. Um, so, and it looks like you're gonna have a, a nice tight group. I think it's gonna be three of you. I think one person has decided that they can't anymore. So that's okay. So that's great. I'm looking forward to that. Um, this last week, um, as I say, you guys did sort of a initial reading about participatory action research to try and get the bones of it down. Um, and then you had a whole bunch of choices for um, what you would actually read about what it actually looked like in action. Um, and as I say, there's a bunch of new ones in there. I was also super happy. Um, there were a couple of them that I've actually had in for a long time. For instance, the Fox and Fine article, um, Accountable to Whom? that a number of you read. Um, I was like debating about whether taking that one off, um, but I'm really glad that I didn't because of the way that you picked up on it. And because I think that the issues that they touch upon, sadly, even though it is from 2013 and here we are in 2022, um, continue to be relevant. And in fact, I have a funny feeling are only becoming more relevant. I was also super interested and excited to see how many people picked up on the Bristow and Atkinson child-led research investigating social, emotional, and mental health and well-being aspects of playtime. Um, uh, one of you, I think it was Allison, noted that this could be interesting on an educational level for so many reasons that uh, if we introduce children to the idea of doing research, that that could be a really interesting learning experience for them. And I love that. And I think that is the case. And that's one of the reasons why YPAR seems so interesting to me as well. Because you think about what are the kids learning while they're engaged in research as well? And what kinds of skills are they also practicing while they're doing things like interviewing their classmates, for instance? Um, so I love that that was, I saw some of that going on. Um, for option A, you guys had an additional posting. So you went back and you looked at um, one of those articles listed above uh, and had more to say about that. And I have to say there was a few comments that I really loved. There's a whole bunch of things, but one of the things that I noted that I really resonated with, Jason said, after reading Fox and Fine, what par is currently being done on how COVID, the COVID pa pandemic has impacted young people? or in how anxiety around global warming and inaction by adults in, the ch in charge is impacting the mental health and worldview of young people. That one really resonated for me. Thank you, Jason, for that, because of conversations that I'm having uh, with colleagues and friends right now too. In fact, just this week, I had almost an identical conversation to what you're saying right there. So many people I know are commenting on particularly adolescents, mental health things. I think young kids, I'm not sure if, the impact is different for them, it quite likely is, but um, I know so many people who are working in secondary schools or who have teenagers um, themselves and are noting the kinds of stress um, that they're going through. Um, and just this week I was chatting with a friend and we said, yeah, I mean, perhaps one of the things is they're recognizing in a really big way 
how we are looking after or not looking after the most marginalized in society. It's like everything that we might have recognized as teenagers, but cranked higher. Um, Wade, I also was really uh, interested in your comment that you noted that Fox and Fine had used performances um, in, in order to convey their findings. Um, and you said sharing the data through performances was a very interesting approach rather than simply publishing the findings. I feel as though it may empower students to openly share their feelings and allow them to put a voice and a face to the data. Could dramatic performances of re research results involving youth have a greater impact on the intended audiences than publishing findings alone? I just have to tell you, I think that is the case. I have been to conferences where people have translated research data into dramatic um, enactments, and I found it extremely powerful. So just to let you know that there are people who are doing that kind of thing, and I will see if I can find a reference maybe uh, for you if you are interested. Okay, so um, coming back to what's coming up. Uh, option B this, this week, we're looking at other people's literature reviews to try and figure out how to assemble their own uh, and then start to dig into theirs. This week coming up, autoethnography. So I think you've probably recognized, if you've had a little peek at it, that the design of the course is to have action research, participatory action research, autoethnography, and dual ethnography uh, introduced you for the first round. So we're kind of cycling through things. And then we go on and we look at action research revisited, participatory action research revisited, autoethnography revisited, and dual ethnography revisited. So, and then we go for a final, the finale of these things. I, um, I designed that in some ways as sort of to give you a taste and then to give you some time to consolidate what you're thinking about these things. Um, and then continue to see contrasts and comparisons of uh, different, different examples in action, uh, action research in action. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say to you guys this week. I was thinking um, some of the postings are getting a, a bit on the long side, which is hard, not just for me, but also for your colleagues. So I would really encourage people to try and keep them down to the 150 more than the 200 limit. I've been seeing a lot of 400 limit and you guys are going to burn out and we're going to burn out if we keep doing that. So let's try and limit, which does mean editing ourselves down. Um, and then I would also ask if people would start putting more white space in. So paragraphing, even though it doesn't feel like a paragraph is necessary, when you're reading online, it really helps us to have more white space. Um, other than that, I'm really, really enjoying what I'm seeing so far, and I'm feeling like I'm beginning to get to know you guys a little bit. I will look forward to your post next week, and we'll chat again. Okay, bye.